saw its fair share of impactful fighter planes on both sides. One of the most formidable planes that took to the skies during that was the Hawker Typhoon. Welcome to another video from War Secrets, in which we are going to take a look at the Typhoon and just what it was that made it such a threat. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to receive the latest notifications from War Secrets. Now let's begin. The Hawker Typhoon, lovingly known as Tiffy by its pilots, was designed in 1937 as a dedicated interceptor to replace the Hawker Hurricane of the 1930s. The system was built to a British Air Ministry specification that called for an aircraft to accommodate the latest Rolls-Royce and Napier 2000 horsepower engines. Thanks to the promising Napier 24-cylinder liquid-cooled 2000-plus horsepower Sabre engine chosen for the airframe, the Typhoon was expected to do exactly that. On paper, the Typhoon would have given the framed Supermarine Spitfire and its legendary Rolls-Royce Merlin engine a run for its money. But history would prove otherwise, and the Typhoon took a whole other path. Initial development of the all-new aircraft revealed some critical design flaws, particularly with the fuselage structure and the new Sabre engine. The first took place in February of 1940, a few months later on May 9th, 1940. A prototype Typhoon experienced a fatal fuselage failure at the base of the empennage, right aft of the cockpit. While the Sabre engine suffered several teething problems, the situation became so difficult that the Typhoon's future was endangered and the Air Ministry considered cancelling the project entirely in favour of purchasing American-made Republic P-47 Thunderbolts. However, things changed in September 1941. The German Air Force's Wolf 190 Werger Series fighter fueled the Typhoon project as a credible competitor to the elusive high-performance German fighter. It was something the Allies had to get. The Typhoon had a menacing appearance. Its most distinguishing physical feature was a huge underfuselage chin radiator installation. The scoop was built into the lower half of the fuselage and located exactly below and beneath the propeller spinner. The pilot's cockpit was at the center of the design, above and aft of the trailing edge of the wing. The fuselage was practically tubular in design, with a typical empennage with a rounded vertical fin at the end. The wings were rounded and had a low monoplane catalever design, with retractable main landing gears and a retractable tailwheel. The undercarriage was typical. The majority of the structure was made up of metal stressed skin. The Typhoon was supposed to be armed with 12 7.7mm machine guns in its original configuration. However, heavy machine guns and cannons, such as the 12.7mm heavy machine guns and cannons, were becoming the norm aboard aircraft throughout the war. As a result, the Typhoon's primary armament system was updated to a more powerful array of four 20mm cannon, two per wing, easily recognized by gun barrel fairings projecting from the leading wing edges. Typhoon's weaponry could be supplemented with high-explosive rockets or standard drop bombs on two underwing hardpoints if needed. The Hawker Typhoon's cockpit required a very steep ascent. Early models had an automobile-style hinged door, similar to the Bell Era Cobra, but due to less than ideal visibility. Later versions of the aircraft had a more classic sliding bubble canopy. Though the automobile-style doors provided a more familiar manner of access into the Typhoon cockpits, they also provided the captain with an unorthodox method of egress should he be forced to bail out of the plane. The Hawker Typhoon's cockpits, like that of some other World War II aircraft, was susceptible to high and dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, to the point where the pilot was practically required to wear his oxygen mask from the moment he started his engine before takeoff until he had safely landed and powered down his engine. Pilots also reported a high level of cockpit noise. A classic control column with a circular spade-style grip was also part of the cockpit. The firing button for the 420mm gun and a braking control were both easily accessible from the grip. The throttle was on the left side of the cockpit, with bomb, rocket flap and undercarriage controls easily positioned. The Typhoon was first developed in August 1941 and received mixed reviews. On the one hand, it was the RAF's first 400mph fighter, but the Napier engine, despite its power, proved to be rather difficult and time-consuming to maintain, as well as being prone to breakdown in the fields. The urge to make it happen was so strong that the power plant was unveiled before it was officially ready for any platform. The cost of pure speed was partially offset by the aircraft's slow rate of ascent. Moreover, while being planned as a high-altitude performance interceptor, the Typhoon performed poorly above medium altitude and surprisingly excelled in low to mid-altitude missions. 
In this regard, the Typhoon outperformed the Supermarine Spitfire in the role. As a result, Typhoons were increasingly confined to this task, and they were outfitted for more conventional ground attack capabilities than they were designed for. When fighting with German bombers and fighters at this level, the Typhoon could engage ground targets while still providing a competitive performance. More importantly, the arrival of the Typhoon put an end to the rowing FW-190 low-level strikes across the southern British shoreline. As the fighter bomber proved capable of engaging these small German aircraft on their own terms at their optimal operating altitude. The structural flaw in the tail design also resulted in delays and some sad casualties. But this was temporarily solved by the installation of 20 alloy riveted fish plates at the Epinage base. The Typhoon was equipped with air to ground rockets and two 250 pound bombs under the wings by 1943. This, combined with the fighter-bomber hybrid's low-altitude performance, resulted in an excellent fighter-bomber hybrid. In both day and night sorties, Typhoons played a significant role in disrupting German communications before the D-Day landings. As the Allied foothold in France grew, so did Typhoon use in terms of forming new front lines for the advancing ground troops. Typhoons began flying from French airfields and, more critically, Holland gave them access to targets on German soil. In this role, Typhoons stayed with the ground battle until the conclusion of the war, providing escort fighter support from Spitfires and Mustangs as needed. Their shelling of German support units was crucial in the strategic thrust that eventually led to the Allied triumph. Whether it was ammo stockpiles, vehicles, railway yards or ground soldiers themselves, no German target was safe from the Typhoons' guns, bombs and rockets. A total of 3,300 Typhoons were built by the end of the war. Despite these numbers, when the jet era arrived in the post-war world, Typhoons were all but dead. Typhoons were retired from service as early as 1946. The Typhoon was used by 26 squadrons at its peak, which is impressive considering the design was almost abandoned during development. As the Typhoon demonstrated, innovative technology takes time to find its place in the market. Early entry into service, development and testing while on the front lines and the foresight of several young squadron commanders all combined to realize the Typhoon as a brilliant ground attack platform, saving the type in the process. Despite problems with the new Napier Sabre engine, the tail structure and carbon monoxide in early aircraft, the Typhoon became known as one of World War II's best and most feared ground assault aircraft. The pilots recognized that this tough platform would get you to the objective quickly absorb a lot of punishment and get you home when other types would have failed. The Normandy landings, with the Typhoon's future certain, established the Typhoon's and its crew's position in history. Without them, the Allies would not have been able to break out of Normandy as rapidly as they did, saving tens of thousands of lives. The ultimate accolade was given by Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander himself. The chief credit in smashing the enemy's spearhead, however, must go to the rocket-firing Typhoon aircraft of the 2nd Tactical Air Force. The result of the strafing was that the enemy attack was effectively brought to a halt, and a threat was turned into a great victory. In times of conflict, aircraft like the Typhoon are marvels. Their initial designs are frequently rigged for failure from the start, only for the ever-changing face of warfare to force the addition of a new role player. In fact, despite the design's flaws and limitations, the Hawker Typhoon was a successful aircraft in every way. By the time the Germans realized what was going on, it was almost too late for the Reich. This brings today's video to an end. What are your thoughts on this absolute legend from the Second World War? And which fighter do you think we should choose for our next video? Do let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to War Secrets. See you around. Bye.